Hello everyone, this is Ted Bauman, editor of The Bauman Letter with your weekly Bauman Daily Friday video from me. Now, uh, today I want to talk about something that um, has been on my mind for a long time, a uh, long time before this current crisis, and that is the relationship between the financial economy and the real economy. Now, uh, a lot of people who have responded to my YouTube videos over the past couple of weeks have used a phrase that uh, is very common uh, in this context, and that is, don't fight the Fed. Now, essentially what that means is that as long as the Federal Reserve is committed to intervening to support asset markets like the stock market, uh, then it's uh, not a good idea to bet against the stock market because the assumption is that whatever the Fed decides to do, it will do to prop up stock markets. Now, whether that's true or not, whether or not the Fed's activities will prop up the stock market indefinitely is a separate question from whether that's a good idea. And for me, what I want to talk about today is what that says about the nature of our economy and about the nature of being an investor in this economy. Now, let's start by looking at some uh, facts and figures. Uh, in the five weeks leading up to April 16th, the Fed bought $1.3 trillion worth of American government debt, treasury bills, 5.9% of 2019 GDP and more than the entire federal budget deficit. Now, as we know, it did this in order to uh, introduce liquidity into the U.S. financial system in order to fend off debt defaults uh, and prevent uh, precipitous declines in asset places like the U.S. stock market. So the question is, um, how does that work and what does that say about the nature of the economy? Well, remember that in countries that print their own money, like the United States, when the Federal Bank or Federal Reserve Bank decides to pump liquidity into the economy, it doesn't, strictly speaking, do it just by uh, printing money and giving it to the government or giving it to anybody else. Instead, it buys U.S. Treasury bills, debts from the private banking system in exchange for creation of new reserves for those banks. So when the Fed buys uh, Treasury bills, they're buying them from the banks who are the primary dealers for Treasury bills and bonds. And in return, they create more reserves for those banks in the bank's um, Federal Reserve accounts. That allows those banks in turn to lend more money, um, whether they want to lend it for business investment or for speculation in the stock market. And it's that route that liquidity takes that is so important. Now, one of the things about this route is that it is inherently designed to favor the interests of banks. The argument for that, of course, is that banks are central to the functioning of the economy and that they must be maintained and they must be healthy and they must be liquid. But the reality is that the Federal Reserve uh, is only um, related to the government directly at the very top. The Federal Reserve Board and Chairman Powell are all government employees, but the rest of the regional Federal Reserve Banks, including the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which does most of these uh, asset swaps and purchases and uh, the transactions that involve QE are all owned by banks located in those regions. They're not owned by the federal government. They're not governed by public employees. They're governed by people appointed by the banks themselves. So in a sense, um, whether you think it's a good system or not, there is an inherent conflict of interest here in that the banks themselves are operating a system that involves taking federal government debt and turning it into additional reserves for the banks themselves who can then use that money to invest in the economy, to lend to other people, to finance takeovers, uh, to create margin accounts for investors, all kinds of things that can help to goose asset prices. Now, let's look at the relationship between the Federal Reserve's uh, uh, buying of assets of qualitative easing, sorry, quantitative easing and pumping money into the economy over the last uh, decade or so. Now, here's a chart that shows on the left-hand side the total balance sheet of the Federal Reserve over the period from about uh, the mid-2000s uh, up until uh, the present day. Now, as you can see, uh, the Federal Reserve had a pretty steady policy. Uh, reserve, rather, um, its balance sheet rose slowly to just under a trillion dollars at the end of uh, 2008, but then it shot up dramatically as it pumped liquidity into the economy during the financial crisis. The 
uh, Fed's balance sheet then rose slowly. It spiked up again in 2011 when there was another uh, stock market panic leveled off and then increased dramatically during 2013, which was another period where it looked as though the economy's recovery was uh, about to uh, reverse. It then leveled off, maintained, didn't uh, pump any more liquidity into the economy, and then it began to taper off by design uh, starting at the end of 2018. Now, you remember what happened in 2018. Uh, the end of 2018, we had a dramatic decline in the stock market, and it only really turned around when the Fed began to uh, intervene again to begin to buy uh, Treasury bonds and to inject more liquidity into the market by reserve purchases. Um, and that in turn erased the slide, uh, sorry, the slide in the stock market that we saw uh, at the end of December 2018. Now, of course, that final uh, upward jag at the very end is the increase in liquidity since the beginning of the coronavirus. And that effectively has taken us very close to $7 trillion worth of Federal uh, Reserve assets. Now, those assets are all debts owed to the Federal Reserve by somebody else, almost entirely in the form of Treasury bonds or mortgage-backed securities. On the right-hand side, you can see the stock market's corresponding action. Now, I've taken the stock market a little bit back further to uh, 1970 to show that really it wasn't until about um, the beginning of the 90s uh, and really the, the heyday uh, of uh, the, the Federal Reserve's initial um, interventions into the economy, keeping interest rates super low, that you began to see um, you know, a, a steady upward rise in the stock market. Up until about 1995, the stock market was actually a fairly sedate place. Um, it, uh, it rose slowly um, over time as the value of companies and their earnings increased. Uh, but generally speaking, it didn't see these tremendous, uh, huge uh, spikes that we've seen recently. Now, what happened was that at that point, Alan Greenspan, who was the chairperson of the Fed, um, really began to tolerate lower and lower interest rates uh, and also it seemed unconcerned about asset bubbles. He did from time to time talk about the fact that they were perhaps not the greatest thing in the world, but he didn't do a lot to rein them in. So over the 1990s, we saw um, a, a dramatic spike in the stock market. Now, some people will say that's because of the emergence of new technologies in the internet, and that's true. And so we saw the dot-com boom and then the dot-com bust around the, the turn of the century. But remember that um, if the interest rates had been higher, if there had been the kind of interest rate regime that we had seen up until uh, the, the 1990s, those alternative investments in treasury bills, the kinds of fixed income act, um, investments that people traditionally kept, would have remained potentially attractive. That would have meant that money would not have flown into the stock market at the rate that it did. Now, that's not uh, to argue that that was the, the only reason why the stock market uh, rose at that time, but we do know that an accommodating monetary policy did allow it, and it led to a tremendous crash uh, from the beginning of the 2000s until uh, roughly about 2003. The stock market then began to recover. Um, it reached uh, roughly the same peak around a little over 1500 for the um, S&P 500 uh, at that time. And then, of course, the financial crisis came. Now, the interesting thing to me is to look at the slope of the line, the, the trend line from the depth of the financial crisis up until today. The rate of increase in the stock market, to me, mirrors um, roughly the rate of increase in Federal Reserve liquidity. Again, it's not always a one-to-one -one comparison, but you can certainly see, uh, for example, uh, in uh, 2013, uh, there was a, a downward jag in the stock market when the Federal Reserve was tapering off its um, quantitative easing. There was another one uh, at the end of 2018 uh, and into 2019, as we all know. Uh, and then today, that final little blip, which you probably can't really see on the screen, but it's the recovery that we've experienced since the uh, beginning of the latest round of quantitative easing, which is that big line on the right-hand side. Now, the point of this is to argue that there is a definite correlation between the Federal Reserve's policies of uh, essentially buying government debt 
in exchange for creating more reserves for the banking system, which in turn should lower interest rates, but also um, keep the banks solvent and allow them to invest and the level of stocks in the stock market. Now, uh, I've spoken before about the price equity or sorry, price earnings ratios in the US stock market. Um, they have risen steadily since the beginning of the year, driven by changes in both the numerator and the denominator. Uh, the numerator being rising stock prices, the denominator uh, being uh, falling earnings forecast. Right now, the uh, projected forward um, price earnings ratio for the S&P 500 is at around 23, which is the highest it's ever been outside of the uh, pre-depression era and the pre-dot-com boost, uh, sorry, dot-com bust era. So really we are at unprecedented high price earnings ratios. That means that people are willing to pay uh, an incredible amount of money uh, for future earnings from American companies. The question is why they would do that and what that says about the nature of our economy. Now remember that the whole point of a stock market is to provide equity for firms who invest in real world activities, whether those activities involve producing physical goods or providing services to people or providing digital goods and services, which as we know is the big thing and has been for more than a decade. But the, the, the whole idea of the stock market is uh, to provide the capital that allows investment in the real economy. Now we've seen declines in real fixed capital formation and investment over the last few years. In fact, over the last decade, um, investment in real fixed capital formation has been amongst the lowest it has ever been over the long period of US economic history. Uh, likewise, earnings were good up until about 2018, but then really they began to decline quarter by quarter. Uh, my colleague Mike Carr has pointed out, I believe that we've had six quarters of earnings declines over the last uh, two years, um, which indicate really that we're in a earnings recession and yet the price uh, of stocks keeps going up. So the real question to ask is what does that say about the stock market? What does it say about how our economy is functioning? Here's my take. In the ideal scenario, um, any gains in stock market or asset prices should be based on the prospects of profit for the companies that you're investing in. Anything else is really short term and is likely to revert to the mean over the long term, unless somehow uh, the financial system is engineered in such a way that it appears that stocks are more valuable than they actually are. That You can do that by several ways. One is by increasing the amount of money available to borrow to buy stocks, which increases the demand for stocks. Uh, the other is by lowering the attractiveness of other assets like bonds, particularly treasury bonds, so that people feel they have no alternative but to uh, buy into the stock market, i.e. TINA. Now, given those kinds of uh, situations, I think the, the correct thing to ask yourself is how sustainable is that over the long term? I think it's not sustainable at all. And Rather than call attention to federal debt, which to my mind is probably a non-starter, uh, given the fact that we have a fiat currency, the real question is, how long are we prepared to live and invest and rely on an economy in which essentially the only thing that is driving up stock prices uh, for the most part is the uh, injection of free liquidity into the economy by the central bank? How much further can the central bank go? Now, Chairman Powell said that they wouldn't resort to um, negative interest rates. He said that earlier this week in his uh, speech on um, Wednesday. Um, but of course they won't do that because the Federal Reserve, uh, particularly the regional banks, are all governed by bankers and federal, uh, uh, negative interest rates would mean that those banks would lose money. It'd be bad for their balance sheet, so they won't do that. So the likelihood is that we will see the Fed continuing to push out liquidity as needed. Now, a lot of people have said, well, we're not going to fight against that. That'll keep the stock market roaring no matter what happens in the real economy. Well, at that point, I think we reached fantasy land. And I think that people who say don't fight the Fed, that you cannot actually um, lose if you invest in a stock market backstop by the Fed, they're living in a fantasy world. Eventually, this uh, charade has to stop. And that's because at the end of the day, every dollar that is lent, every dollar that is created has to be redeemed at some point in the future by actual economic activity. If the economy is not growing fast enough to create that economic activity, then at some point those dollars simply cease to have value. 
Now, I know that uh, I'm on record as having said that uh, consumer price inflation is not a threat right now because most of the money that is being created through Fed quantitative easing is not getting into the real economy. Most of it is going into the financial sector and into asset speculation. But if it becomes, uh, if we get to the case where uh, it becomes clear that we will not have enough economic production to keep up with the pace of increase in the issuance of this money, which goes into driving up inflation and in asset markets, the stock market, then what happens? Stock prices fall, folks. So the bottom line here is that if you're putting your hope in the Fed to maintain stock prices, I think you're making a grave mistake. It might work in the short term, but we're already seeing signs, it, particularly from Wall Street itself, major investment houses, major investors, people who have made billions of dollars uh, investing in the stock market are all saying the same thing. It gets to the point where it no longer makes sense, even with the Fed's backstopping, simply because people will lose confidence that these high P.E. ratios, these high stock prices will ever be redeemed by uh, future economic production. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to crash to a depression era lows, but certainly we could see a pullback of 10 or 20 or even 30 percent in the stock market sometime in the next 24 months. Whether it all happens at once or whether it happens gradually, in a sense, doesn't really matter. The key thing is that if the big boys on Wall Street are starting to lose confidence in the Fed's put, the Fed's backstop for um, the one market that actually is experiencing inflation, i.e. the stock market, then at that point, folks, I think we need to start listening to them. I'm not suggesting um, that you cease investing by any means. In fact, in the Bauman letter, the focus is on finding the companies that will continue to grow and continue to prosper, particularly by paying dividends uh, over the, the next uh, period of economic turmoil. But in general, chasing after stock prices simply because you believe that the Fed won't let things get any worse uh, is probably a fool's errand right now. And it's not one that I would recommend anybody follow. It's not necessarily a bearish take on American enterprise or on the economy. It's just an observation that this is not the way capitalism is supposed to work. It's not supposed to be based on the endless creation of liquidity and the handing out of money uh, into the economy by, federal, uh, by the Federal Reserve Bank. And ultimately, when we get to the point where the disjuncture between those flows of quantitative easing and the actual economic activity taking place on the ground gets so big, People are going to recognize it and things are going to turn for the worse. I hate to say that because I don't want that to happen. All I want to do is to make sure that you have heard my viewpoint, uh, which you are free to disagree with, but I want it out there uh, and I want people to understand that that's my rationale for the things that I say. Whether it's a double bottom, a long U or a swoosh or whatever it may be, at the end of the day, what matters is the real economy of real people producing real goods and services. Everything else is just entries on an accounting ledger, and you can't eat those folks. This is Ted Bauman signing off. Remember to subscribe to the Bauman Letter if you're not already. Um, we have some great uh, opportunities uh, coming up. We have especially a great opportunity in our last newsletter, specifically on the question of uh, dividend-paying companies. A lot of them are at trading at cheap discounts right now, which means you can lock in high future yields. So if you're not a subscriber already, give it a bash. Then, um, if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, click on the subscribe button below and become a regular subscriber to the Bauman Daily Podcast. Uh, this is Ted Bauman signing off. I'll speak to you again next week.